Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the MedTech Impact Podcast, where you get to hear from leaders and innovators who are shaping the future of medical technologies. I'm Kyle Cruz. And I'm Richard Mikkeljohn. And we're your hosts of the show. Today with us, we have Tufik Azar, co-founder, CEO, and CTO of MiaCore. Tufik, thank you so much for joining us welcome, today. I appreciate Tufik. it. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle and Richard, for having me here. It's, an, it's a pleasure and an honor as well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, and well, I can't wait to tell the story. Please do. I mean, obviously you have uh, an innovative heart repair device um, that we want to talk about today, and we really want to also hear about your story. So let's start with a quick little introduction uh, about who you are and, and that technology that you're developing today. Um, great, thanks. So so it all started when I was doing my PhD in McGill. Um, so Renzo Ciccieri, he's a cardiac surgeon there. He came to us and he's like, I have to solve this problem and we have no solution right now. We know how to, to repair the heart valves using open heart surgery, but we can't do it with the catheters. And there's a big subset of you know, target population. So we went in, tried so many different ideas. I'm not kidding, like maybe more than 10 ideas. Each one, like we fattened in three different concepts, completely different concepts. And at the final year of my PhD, he came up with this other new concept, completely different. Um, and then we're like, okay, I'm not gonna go back to the older ones because this one was much more simple, much more, uh, if you want, elegant. Um, we launched a startup called MiaCore, which stands for my heart in Latin. And then took it from there, we said, we're gonna try to develop it and get to where we are today. Um, the company was based in Montreal. We had an R&D office in Lebanon, Beirut, because I'm Lebanese as well. And finally, we moved to the US a couple of years ago based in Massachusetts, in Boston. And the reason is all our manufacturing, all the suppliers are mainly in the US. And right now we've gone through two accelerators, which is, was very great. So which is M2D2 Impact is one of them. Second one was MedTech Innovator. Learned a lot, but all the industry players. And we're happy now to, we, we are at the stage where we're looking to fundraise, to, to build a team in the US. Mm -hmm. So a couple of millions to get our animal data and hopefully get to humans in two, three years. Sure. So our target is to move very quickly. And, and what about the heart repair device? I mean, what was that? You, you know, you went through 10, you said, did you say 10 patents? No. So we went through three initial concepts, three different okay. patents. And then on the latest one, we've expanded up in one patent and we're like now at six at least. Okay. Within the same, you know, we call them uh, six patent families. Sure. And it's really the concept of, the challenge actually that they've all gone is you have this hard valve that's leaking blood because it's either too big or there's something wrong with the apparatus. So you have the leaflets, the cords, and the annulus. Mm. And coming from Renzo, who is a surgeon, the main, if you want, the main approach in open heart surgery is to put a ring on the side on the valve, so suture a ring to shrink its area and stop the leakage. And it's useful in all the different etiologies or the or different you know subset of the disease. And really, really wanted to focus us on replicating this using a catheter. So a catheter is a tube that goes into the femoral vein all the way to the heart. It's around five, six millimeter in diameter ID. And you've got to send something that will repair the heart valve. And so the access route is known. They've been doing this for quite some time for other, for, for example, EP. Um, and we came up with this concept of how can we replicate or how can we shrink the air of the valve using the same three, if you want to call them the trilemma. We have to have good positioning of our device, good anchoring of our device in a quick and efficient manner to stop regurgitation. So we came up with this concept of using cryo to stick to the tissue, like you know when your tongue sticks on ice, yeah. then advance over that a helicoid anchor. Because our guide is elongated and you have a helicoid anchor that goes around it, at every rotation, that anger's penetrates tissue come back, comes back out. Penetrates comes back out. So once you put that anchor longitudinally along the valve, you remove your catheter tip and you leave behind this coil. Mm -hmm. So you do it twice. Then you have a wire connecting those coils. You pull on the wire and you shrink the area like a purse string effect. Sure. So sure. technically you're building a ring using two, three anchors. 
I can come up later to explain what's the other advantages to this approach. But mainly you, you distribute the load, it's safe and it's on demand. So if you make a mistake, you stop the cooling, you, you reposition and you know you have the right locations because when you cool, you stick and well, you don't damage tissue as well. Absolutely. And it's, and it's nice because I like how you, you were focused on the catheter technology, that minimally invasive approach over maybe more of that open heart surgery approach. It sounds like there's a, there's probably a, a pretty fair advantage there. Yeah. So, so the thing is most of these patients are elderly and the, the risk for conventional sur surgery is elevated. So they, they really the, the risk outweighs the benefits. So that's why you require catheters. So that's why there've been so many development in this field. Absolutely. Yeah, it's the future of... Hundreds of companies trying to develop uh, valve technologies. Mm -hmm. So you could see, for example, the other valve, which is the aortic valve, which has gone from zero catheter interventions to now more than 100,000, which is mm -hmm. quite a big jump. And, and the thing is, it expands the population. It doesn't just replace the open heart surgery. You still do open heart. But now you can treat way more patients with those catheters. Okay, that's that's really the gist of it. And, and yeah, Tufik, how big a problem is this? Like, how often are these types of procedures being done on an annual basis? Actually, not a lot. So, uh, for example, the mitral valve is around. If you look at the data, there's around forty thousand surgery in the U.S., which is not a lot. Open heart surgery. And now, if you look at the only device on the market, which is the mitral clip by Abbott, they have around twenty thousand. Uh, implantation worldwide so and the, the the number of patients that have the disease is two percent of the general population or ten percent above 75 so if you just capture ten percent of that number you'll see that you have hundreds of thousands that could potentially be eligible mm -hmm. and the thing is that's why it's a big market and that's why there's so much development going on there and quite a few if you want to call it uh, failures or because initially it was, let's try to do something that's similar, but not the same as open heart, to now realizing that you really have to try to replicate what works well in open heart. You know, they've tried to approximate things. They used to have, for example, one of the major disadvantage of most of these companies or, or in development was we put those anchors. So the principle is quite similar. We put anchors around the valve with a wire and then we, we pull on it, it shrinks the area of the valve. But those anchors were actually getting loose, not strong enough. Um, the, the distances were too big. Uh, so there's a lot of, you know, it's really in the details where, where the failures come from. And we hope that we actually solve this by having a much, if you want to call it robust anchoring method. I call it, I like to use the, the word robust from an engineering perspective, because mm. you uh, always uh, have the same depth of insertion and the same, de and the same shrinkage if you want. Yeah, and I think you've been doing animal trials to date. I mean, can you talk a little bit more about the development process? And yes, so, so what we did is, so it took us, we've been working on this for a couple of years now. The first two to three years were like, uh, it was, first of all, it was my first time doing catheters, so I had to do, to do catheter development. So we kept everything in-house. We have three engineers. What we did initially is we did um, a full-fledged, we had to prove, so, the, the real, the, uh, to give you an idea how it usually works, you take the concept that you have, you try to put it in an open heart animal lab on an animal, and you see how it progresses. So you do an acute study, can you install it? And then you do a long-term study where you keep the animal alive, you see how's the implant progressing, because here you're doing an implant. Then the second step would be, now I need to deliver or to develop a delivery system. But in our case, we like, there's way more, you know, we can do the open heart. I mean, it's easy to do on a cadaver heart. It's not that, I don't think it's that, you know, um, challenging at this point. We need to focus on, can we really cool down, stick to the tissue and advance an anchor? So we spent the first couple of years trying to figure out what's the best way to cool down our catheter tip, which is a linear tip. And at this small size to be able to stick, you know, to freeze and stick to, this, to the analyst. And we, we managed to do that at the end of the day using um, a, 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 a gas, our own console. And it's very quick. And after that, it was now, it's a matter of fact, let's just go and do the anchoring, cinching. So now the plan is to go ahead and do uh, the open heart in a live animal, and then also the catheter in a live animal. So in parallel, we have to do development. 
So we did four animals um, up until today. The last one was to prove the cooling, which worked. Then the second, and then in anchor installation. And now the next one would be to, our next animal is coming up soon, is to put two anchors with a coil and shrink the area and, and, and uh, yeah, and keep it there and see how the animal survives. Yeah, that's that's really neat. And what about Tufik? You know, I want to kind of bring this back here. You know, it's fun go- getting into the the weeds on your technology, and I'm, we definitely have a, many more questions and want to talk more about it. But kind of what, what's like, you know, before McGill, right? You get to McGill. Obviously, McGill, one of the most prestigious universities, um, you know, in the world, known for you know their their efforts and and advancements in medical device technologies and biomedical engineering, no doubt. But like, what was it that inspired you to go there? Like, what was that upbringing like? Did you have family in this industry? You know, what, 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 or was there something that happened in your life where you had something happened to go and do this? I'll tell you what happened. So when I was, when I was in high school, it was, do I, I wanted to go, I had to apply for some, you know, a degree. And my parents were like, you know, you're very good also in, in biology. And so I'm like, okay, either I go into medicine or I go to engineering. And I remember I had this conversation with my dad. He's like, apply for both. I'm like, no, I'm going for engineering. I want to build stuff. So I remember when I was young, I used to build like uh, houses, uh, play a lot of toys. So like, you know, those those big, uh, if you want to call it like tents, but made out of stone with, uh, with cement. I was like, you know, 10. So I, I always love to build. What? And, and that and sounds like a real structure, though, like that you yeah. could live in. So I had nothing to do with small stuff. And I heard of happened. Legos. I used to build yeah. houses with Legos, <laughs> but not stone and cement. I I'm telling to... you, it was stone and cement, making sure they don't fall off. And I was young. <laughs> and then what happened is after that, um, I went to the engineering thinking I was going to change the world. This is the thing is you go in engineering, you think you're going to work on life changing topics. And it didn't ha- we ended up building some small robots that go up the stairs, drops, you know. And it was all theoretical. And I'm like, no, we need to work on something else. So I went to see my professor, George Angelis. And I did the course. He was he's one of the best in robotics. And he's like, you know what? I have this problem. Renzo came to us for it. Do you want to do your master's PhD on it? So combined. It was initially a master's. And then I'm like, you know what? It's a challenge. I'm going to take it up. And I took it up. And I, I had no idea. I was, I was like, well, very young. And then sure. I didn't realize it was that it was going to be that of a big route or. A, a, yeah. That's amazing. Long... That one conversation has led you down this path. And it's like, yeah. 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 It's, it's a bit. But so now I, I've got a. So the idea is now great idea. We just have to continue execution. And get to stage where it's going to be taken over by you know usually uh, um, the big companies. Sure. Well, I think I think that story though says a lot about kind of you and where you're at too. Because I mean, at the end of the day, right? There's something inside all of us that kind of led us, you know, on that path in life in our career. And you know, when you have those types of interests and passions in your early life as a child and a kid and you grow up and and the cool part is too is hearing your story too is like not only were you passionate about the engineering side and changing the world right but it really sounds like you were you were really you were open to a lot like almost anything and everything right and I think when you have an open mind and you're so passionate it's it you know things kind of gravitate and come to you um and it maybe it will allow you to identify exciting opportunities you know like what you're doing today um so you know really cool i'm glad you were able to kind of share that background uh because you know clearly you embarked on 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 developing a technology and bringing a a life improving life saving technology to market that you know has been asking and begging for innovation yet it's incredibly challenging and difficult it sounds like to obviously go about develop and prove the efficacy and build up that data and bring that product but i mean hey if anyone's going to do it i mean too fit come on man that's you're the guy for the job, so no, it's it's great that to to hear that that side of uh, your story. There's no yeah, doubt. well said, Kyle. And I, and I think Tufik as well. The thing that stands out is you're obviously a natural explorer because you've gone and moved to Canada, and now you're here in Massachusetts. So how's that transition yeah. been in terms of moving around? It's it's not that di- well, it's not that difficult actually. To be honest with you, it's just the fact that you've got to re- uh, you identify a few spots every time you go to a new area, 
and then you make it home. You, you know, you create this whole small, uh, if you want, uh, they call that like a small village. It becomes, it doesn't become a city anymore. But the key here is relationships with people. And I won't be here without everyone that has helped me so far. Like I've gotten so many uh, what favors and I still get favors because they all want to get us, help me get where I want to go. You know, from IP, uh, lawyers, uh, people that I've even gotten, for example, free tubing from Japan, from so, and even manufacturing, they've always, you know, given me rates much, much, much lower than anywhere else, just to get me off the, uh, to get off the start line. And then today is the time really where in a way it's a do or make, I'm a do or die because we really now have to go in, get the big injection of money to get where we have to go. And- I was gonna say that's something that really stands out to me about you personally though, since I've known you is just your ability. I mean, you're saying this like naturally it was so easy to move, but like your ability to network and to like leverage that network. Because I guess, you know, you said you moved two years ago. So that's probably still in the midst of the pandemic and you were able to still connect with people and- So, so actually, um, so I've been coming here for a couple of years now, four or five years. years. Okay. And, but only coming here and just going to work at this facility, if you want, IMD, Innovative Medical Design. One of the best, uh, most talented actually engineer and catheter manufacturer I, I've actually ever met. Uh, and this is coming from a lot of other engineers as well. Um, so we, we go there and I used to come here often. And when I moved in, it was actually the day of, like I moved in the year of the pandemic. It was deserted. It, was, it wasn't very good. So the whole point of me moving here was to make connections. It was very hard in the first two years because it was all pandemic. I used to go to work. I remember it used to take like 35 minutes and, and to come back, to go and come back. But then again, the past year or so, a lot have changed. I've met a lot of people and, and keep meeting more people and more and more people right now. Hopefully, the thing is, I, I'm, I'm in a field that's dominated by two people. So either it's a doctor that actually does an invention and then he goes and markets it using his own, uh, if you want his own network. And because he's done this before, so a, you know, a KOL if you want, mm -hmm. or it's industry um, veterans that have been doing this for 20, 30 years, they keep on taking new projects. So here you have, you know, a younger guy at, who started this at 30 and he's trying to solve this. He doesn't really have this um, track record so it does go against me a little bit, but the key is to surround yourself with very good people. So I have very good, a very good board member, Nadim Yared. He's, he's, his company now is IPO. He's done a lot of development. Hopefully now we're adding a, a fifth board member that has a lot of experience. And obviously building yourself around with people with you know quality experience, regulatory, uh, and obviously manufacturing design. All of that. Well, it's great. It's great too to see, you know, to your point, the team that you've built. I mean, I, you know, just hopping on your website and seeing that team and and looking into their, you know, what they do currently and their past hit history of success. And it's just, it's you clearly have surrounded yourself with, you know, big time players. There's no doubt, um, real experts uh, in 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 the cardiovascular uh, industry. So um, that's that's really neat. And um, geez, I had a question. Um, oh, yeah. So you were mentioning that, you know, there were a lot of partners kind of coming to the table and helping, you know, you mentioned the tubing, right, and providing maybe other equipment components. I mean, at the end of the day, your technology is is not only are you trying to figure out how to do something that's pretty sophisticated and complex, but your your technology, too, seems fairly sophisticated, complex, and and maybe quite expensive you know i mean what did it take to even go out and design and even build your device today and kind of where are you at from that physical device standpoint um so it's so so there were two ways to take on the development actually so when we started was we can outsource the development to those you know contract development firm or i can learn everything from scratch and i learned everything from scratch with the help of, if you want to call it a mentor or the the uh, the, the experts that has been doing catheters for so long, his name is Tai Kian at mm -hmm. IMD. And the way we did it is 
we, because we've manufactured everything and design and manufacture everything from handles to cabling. So now it's every fun, we fundamentally know so well the device, even the console sure. was sure. built in house. Good. So it's a complex system. Yes. Three catheters plus the console. Um, it is expensive right now mm -hmm. to build because it's, you know, low volume, but eventually it's not going to be very, um, it's going to be within the same order of magnitude of all the other devices. Right. With right. The, the exception of that you have a console. Sure. Yeah, question. when something's when something's so sophisticated too, you know, I mean, I, I think that's kind of um, you know, it probably was quite the undertaking, you know, it was a, probably a fair amount amount of work and time spent in understanding how to build your product and technology and all the components and the design elements. But it does make a lot of sense because at the end of the day, now you know your product best, you know exactly how it's built, you know exactly all the components, you know how it goes together, you know how it's uh, how it's assembled and manufactured. So now having all of that knowledge, you're going to be able to, you know, understand and identify opportunities for as you continue to grow supply chain improvements, manufacturing and assembly efficiencies, you know, uh, you'll be able to automate some of those processes, which is great, you know, and I would imagine that if you if you maybe let you know a, a development firm come in early and, and really take on most of that responsibility well then you might not be as close to your to your product as you are today so um, I, I think that was it sounds like a great move, you know. Yeah, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about IMD, so innovative medical design, you, you know, where you're based now and just how that's played a role in this manufacturing process. Yeah, so fundamentally, they were key. Uh, I mean, had I not found them, I would not have been here today. I'm going to be very... So how it started, this was a, start, a company started by actually a, a refugee from Cambodia, Tai Kri Kian, oh. who came into the US with nothing, started working as a machinist in... Uh, at Bard Medical, then went all the way up from machining. He got a degree in engineering, plastic degree, and he was so good with his hands, he got to taste, well, not just taste, you know, um, get, uh, you know, what do you call that? Develop his skills in every single aspect of catheter, manu catheter manufacturing. So, you know, from reflow, plastic extrusions, braiding, tip, implants, and then he founded this company, IMD. And the role, the key role of IMD is if you have a technology or an idea, just at an ideal level, he will onboard you, put a pump a prototype. I've seen him pump a prototype in a week or two. Some people that, that had gone for six months with other companies, you know, very reasonable expenses. Uh, he has, for example, to give you an idea, he has now more projects in the pipelines, people knocking on his door. He doesn't, he doesn't take people because he's so busy. Wow. Because of his skill set. And then yeah. the idea is he takes it from prototype, he builds it for you, you keep developing it with him until the stage where there's no agreement, but he he, he hopes that you'll end up manufacturing in his facility down the line. Mm -hmm. It sounds like he found the perfect home. And I think it's just another one of these incredible assets from Massachusetts and you know how it just draws in all these amazing entrepreneurs and these inventors. And then places like IMD start just off the back of those skill sets that get built up through their own personal journey. And then a lot of his clients, if you want to call them, are professors at Harvard, MIT, uh, doctors. And there's a lot of troubleshooting as well. A lot of people come back to him after some issues because he has a skill set to do it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. but he did, he, what he did was he took the time. He, you know, he started, you know, like on that ground level and he wasn't in a rush and he learned and he understood every nuance and every, you know, everything that goes into making those catheter technologies. And I think what happens is again, it's, you know, that you see a lot of people giving out career advice and they always say, Hey, you don't just rush to the top. You don't just go and skip all these steps trying to get rich quick or, you know, I put that in quotations or finding success quick, right? It's, 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 it's start at the bottom, you know, stay true to the process, you know, learn, build and, and take the time. And then what happens is you become that expert naturally, right? And then everyone's coming to you like that. And then you start to experience that success. So, I mean, just the direction, you know, that, that career path is, um, uh, you know, of your colleague there and partner, it's, um, it's inspirational, no doubt. And it's, it's, 
I think, you know, it's the right way to go about things. So, you know, great points yep. there too. Yeah, yep. absolutely. So you, you've had this move, um, you find that as a big spur to kick on. What else has kind of like been a real benefit to you since you've moved to Massachusetts, kind of helping you progress to so, go forward? It's something very easy. It was very like, the, some suppliers are like a driving distance. So early on, when I say early on, like two, three years ago, we used to pump a prototype every week or every two weeks. I used to drive, I need some special tubing. Hey guys, I need this rush. I go pick it up from, for example, New Hampshire, come back. Like this ecosystem, like three suppliers are very close. Uh, it's, 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 it makes it easiest. So there's the same if you want in the Bay, not the Bay Area, but South California, South California, Minneapolis. So these hubs, this is the key. So they all concentrate, you know, the whole supply chain actually concentrates there. And um, also being, you know, close, uh, in our case, uh, the other advantage of being in Massachusetts is you meet people that have done this quite a lot because it's a mature ecosystem. It's very key here. So, for example, our quality is a very mature. Uh, he's an engineer, has done this many, many times. There's a lot, I can tell you this, in this industry, there's a lot of people that talk a lot and give you a big, big, you know, price tags on a lot of services. You have to be very careful of, you know, who you pick as, as you know, partners. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's where it stands. And then obviously the networking for fundraising, hopefully now I'm getting some contradicting. Uh, so <laughs> the problem is we are in the middle of, a, you wanna call it, people are not deploying capital a lot. And this has actually prevented us from going and being able to raise easily the money because on paper, we have everything, the patents, uh, granted, we also have one of the biggest for like we're doing also a good patent audit, uh, hopefully, and then uh, we also have the, the the design is there, so the concept is not fully proven, but the principle is proven. So all it needs is is, is money injection, and going to do iterative testing. Mm -hmm. That's why I went to these accelerators to try to fundraise. We did get a lot of interest from the strategics, so all of them are interested. So we know there's a need. So at the end of the day, you're designing this product and you're not gonna event, you're not gonna distribute it yourself until uh, unless you really wanna go do the IPO, IPO route. You wanna make sure that the big players would want you if you are successful. Mm -hmm. Because many, many times we've seen it, specifically in, in the Vavre space, this company raised 20 million, 30 million, and nobody wants them. Mm -hmm. Because they, they think they have something that would work, but it ends up being either either too complex or not, or the outcome is not you know good enough. It, such is an this important a... point? Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that's such an important point you're making, um, yeah. Kyle, because I was talking about this yesterday or a couple of days ago with Rich Anders, a local uh, angel investor, and to his point, it's just this fact that a lot of people start with the idea, they they figure out there's a bit of need for it, but they don't think about that bigger picture, that longer term exit. And so many of these companies will end up being acquired because that's just the way the market works. And so actually forming relationships early uh, with the big yeah. strategics is so important. And I think this is often overlooked. So yeah, I think you've taken a great approach and, and I know we spoke about how much great feedback you've got, but of course, facing the same challenges like a lot of people is getting that early capital to get the initial data and de-risk it is still a challenge. Yeah. So, so ideally the best way right now is be to be to take some non-dilutive grants where we yeah. fail to get them for the same reasons that I think we're not getting it. It's a, uh, it's a niche. Well, I wouldn't call it niche, but there's a bit of a fatigue from investors, by the way, on this field. You know, there's like more than hundred companies were were funded. Only one is in the market. Maybe two would make it, and you still have like thirty companies doing valve replacements. Hopefully, also because you you need both repair and replacement, depending on the category of patients, and hopefully one or two will make it. And it always ends up being the same. So only one or two will end up occupying 90% of the space, of the market space. Are these and mostly PMA or are they 510K? Only PMAs, only PMAs. Oh, right, exactly. Because they don't technically yeah. exist, right? So Only PMAs. Oh, right. Uh, you know, I think we could go get breakthrough designation for the uh, tricuspid valve okay. technology. I don't think it's the same for the macho. Right. So the, the key here is in our technology is it's a suturing or anchoring method which has applications in either valves, but also another thing that came out of, let's say, you know, discussions is they would like to see this in endoscopic suturing. 
because you need suturing or anchoring when you go, you know, using endoscopes, you know, in, in the stomach, you know, in, in other parts of the body where it's very hard to actually grasp tissue, go in with a needle, come back out. So you could do the same thing now using a robotic arm or a robotic tip mm -hmm. or zero tip by hand, which you freeze, you put on tissue, you advance your coil over it. Mm -hmm. And then when you reverse the coil, you leave behind the suture. Uh, it's a bit uh, intricate, but it's it's very simple, very elegant way of suturing in tissue. Sure. This, this yeah. would be a five ten k, for example. This could be become a sp spun off technology which, into a different product. Yes. But again, we now focus on the bigger market because mm -hmm. we've gone so far. I mean, we're so close. If you want. Yeah. And yeah. Because typically those that PMA process is obviously it's it's ten times the amount of money, work, investment, time, typically, you know, I mean, significantly more than 510K. Do you think that at all has maybe posed some of those challenges too of the, you know, where sure. you, you kind of run into these little kind of, you know, where you're stuck in this kind of limbo where it's like, oh, we need to raise capital, but we need more data and it's going to take X amount of time. It's, does, is that part of maybe? So what happens, what's actually happening is it's a bit weird. So angel groups like to do uh, five, 10 Ks, but they realized at least in the past couple of years that the, the five, 10 Ks, the strategic won't acquire a five, 10 K just because they got five, 10 K. They want to see revenues, traction. Yeah. You have to go way more down the line mm -hmm. in, in the company development. Whereas if you have a PMA, you, you can get acquired quite early after like once you got for example good chronic animal data you've done it first in human doesn't have to be in the us you can get acquired very quickly so it's actually more pmas are more attractive for for big companies believe it or not for strategics than mm -hmm. five ten ks i think richard you've seen this a lot you have a lot of five ten k companies mm -hmm. they can they have a good product but they can get acquired i wanted to talk a little bit now about how your time through the impact program has helped you and, uh, and just your experience through that. So what impact was amazing. It was, you know, my first, if you want overview of all the different um, categories that you need to do, go through a development of the product. You know, you, you've got, I know, you know, the stages. So you have product uh, proof of concept phase, then you have product development, then you have market launch, but then you have top categories where you have the, the management, then you have the engineering, the R&D, the legal, the IP, regulatory, manufacturing, quality. So impact took every category, gave us some experts and it allowed us to understand more, you know, what's required, what, what are the steps needed to get there. And this is just, just if you had go, if you understand this, it will facilitate a lot, you know, the global vision on the, the product development cycle. And impact was great at that. Also, uh, what we did is uh, the mentoring was amazing, was really one-to-one, -one, improved a lot. The deck, the numbers, uh, the milestones, how much money is required, you know, give, you know, a grounded, you know, view of what's needed. Great to hear. And and, I think especially yeah. for you, because, you know, you had the cohort driven by Sci Intech, and I think, again, that helped you form some great relationships to have that interaction and that feedback loop from them. 100%. And then we got also the other accelerator because of this accelerator. So we graduated from M2D2 and ended up with MedTech Innovator, which was a great one as well. Yeah, absolutely. MedTech Innovator yeah. doing some awesome things, and, yeah, they'll be announcing their next cohort very soon. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and Tufik, I mean, you've mentioned, you know, obviously um, the importance of of partner, you know, partners and relationships and um, surrounding yourself with certain people, you know, I guess, you know, and, and also the challenges of bringing a technology, a, a new innovative technology to market like this. Um, you know, what kind of advice do you have? What kind of tips do you have for, you know, other innovators, uh, entrepreneurs that are looking to maybe follow, you know, your type of career path and, and bring a product to market that truly doesn't exist. You know, number one is you make sure that the need exists. So, you know, you need to have a, a good partnership with a good doctor. If you're an engineer, the other guy, you know, 
you can't just start doing ideas just because you know you have technology that has never been applied in medical devices. So I'm just gonna bring it in and apply it. You start from the need, that's one. And you know, forge good, good relationship with your founder, co-founder. You say, same outlooks, you know that he's in it to stay, he's not gonna run away. I've seen a lot of companies, they go in. She, I, I've heard this like you know, a lot longer time ago, they start this medical device company or medical AI, and six months later, the company is out. What's happening? Oh, my co-founder found another job, the other co-founder found another job. You don't want that, so that's solidity of the team. But the other also big thing is you're gonna get a lot of no's as well. And we've seen I've seen that. So for example, five years ago when I was just starting, we went to this, I'm not gonna name people. The reply was these guys will never make it. Mm. He told he told someone else behind my back, oh, forget them. They don't know anything about catalytic development, they'll never make it, they'll never be able to develop this complex product. Here we are today with solid IP, solid concept, and not yet fully, fully proven, but at least with the more money, we will, we will prove it. I can guarantee that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, pe many people will say, will tell you, no, so you've got to keep persevering. Sure. And uh, that's, that's also another point. Yeah. And, and the other thing, the third thing is ask for help. People will ask, it will help you. I've heard this many, many times before given to me is started with me. Thank you for helping me or thank you for the introduction. Uh, they, people will help, you know, that's the thing here. Don't be shy to ask. Yeah, those are all, those are all great points. You know, I mean, I, I love it. It's, it's just, it's so the need, right. Is it, that's so important, right? There's gotta be a need, the team. I mean, the people you surround yourself, they got, everyone's gotta be all in, you know, and yeah, you're right. People are going to shut you down. They're going to tell you no. Right. And when you believe so strongly and you're so passionate about something, you use the nose as inspiration and as motivation. And uh, that's what you've done here to fix. So um, just I'm, I'm inspired. Yeah, go ahead. So let me just, so now I'm in no yeah. phase for me, like the past yeah. couple of months has been, has been, it's a no phase. So I know I will get there. Like we will do our best to at least pass this phase because after that it becomes much easier. Absolutely. We're like in the gray zone right now, or the demilitarized zone, if you want to call it. <laughs> so you you need a nice, small little investment to get you there. So how do people, right, hearing you and learning about your technology today, how do people get a hold of you? What's the best way to uh, to reach reach out to you? Um, and, and Email is the easiest, tufik at mayacore.com, as simple as that, T-O-U-F-I-C at mayacore.com. And you can reach out also on the website. Um, uh, but yeah, so so let's see what's going to happen now in the next couple of months. It's right. we're confident. We we also might have some capital injection from existing investors, um, and hopefully we we'll get to the reach the milestone, which will allow us, you know, to grow at a much faster faster pace. Tell us what's the big vision. Where would you like to be in say five years time with Miacor? Um, in five years time, hopefully, I would. The way I see things is I want to see the first in human. That's my major milestone. I did an animal. I didn't expect I was going to get to it. So some people, the, at, at least I got to the animal. Now I want to see a human. Once I see a human, it changes everything. Uh, and then either I take it, potentially I would like to reach a lot, well, help as much as I can get to the market. Mm -hmm. So still, I think next three years are going to be crucial in getting there. Right now, we know it's everything's it's going to have to go much faster, much quicker. Uh, and yeah. And then do I see this as my after my, all my life? No, I'm going to move on to another device afterwards. Because, you know, I need you need to, to keep generating new concepts in your mind because it gets, I won't call it boring, but uh, your mind is new, uh, uh, what do you call this word? New motivation, new challenges. And it would be something potentially a device that's not targeting the older the population that's old. It would be for someone, for everyone. You're an eternal builder as you were as a child. Yeah. It never goes away. That's no, right. no. 
Well, this has been an amazing discussion here today, guys, and, and conversation with you too, Fick. Thank you uh, so much for coming on our podcast and our show and, and sharing your story. Um, we're inspired. There's no doubt we want to wish you the very best and keep up the great work. And hopefully there's people out there watching today that are also inspired and would like to uh, join you on your mission um, and help in any way. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, as well. Absolutely. All right, everybody. That is the MedTech Impact Podcast. Today's episode with Tufik Azar, co-founder, CEO, CTO of Mia Corp. Thanks, everybody, for watching. In. Until next time, I'm Kyle Cruz. And I'm Richard Mikuljan. And until next time, keep innovating.